Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the University of Maine Cooperative Extensions Preserving the Maine Harvest webinar. I'm Kathy Savoy, and we'll also be joined today by two other colleagues. Kate McCarty is in the demo kitchen, and our moderator will be Lori Bowen. This webinar series is designed to provide you with current USDA recommendations for preserving foods at home. Our monthly webinars will feature foods that are in season and that are corresponding with our main growing cycle throughout the year. Today is one of our uh, warm but rainy fall days. Um, so we're enjoying today to spend time with you on our webinar. The mission of the University of Maine Cooperative Extension is to help Maine people improve their lives through an educational process that uses research-based knowledge that's focused on issues and needs. Our educational programs include agriculture, horticulture, which encompasses the very popular Master Gardener program, 4-H youth development, food safety, and nutrition. And finally, we want to let you know that the University of Maine is prohibited from discriminating on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, disability, and reprisal or retaliation for prior civil rights activity. Today, we, we will focus on freezing fruits and vegetables. This method of food preservation preserves food with a texture that's closer to fresh than canning, while also preserving nutrients and flavor. We'll offer tips for getting the most out of your freezer this harvest season and well into the winter months ahead. But before we begin, some housekeeping. We have our webinar set up so that you can hear and see us, but we cannot hear or see you. But we do want to answer your questions, so please ask them as they come up for you during our presentation by simply using the Q&A feature, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So thanks again for joining us on this rainy main day, and let's get started. So let's talk a bit about how freezing affects food. First off, a reminder that freezing does not sterilize foods. The extreme cold of your freezer simply slows the growth of microorganisms. Home freezers should be set at zero de degrees Fahrenheit or lower to maintain safety and quality of your food. And I'd also like to advocate for having a thermometer placed in your freezer so that you can know if it is working at zero degrees Fahrenheit or not, which will allow you to be able to make those adjustments to get it to be zero degrees Fahrenheit, which can sometimes take up to 24 hours um, after you have made that adjustment. Quality can be an issue with home frozen foods. Ice crystals, off flavors, a mealy texture. These are pitfalls that could ruin your frozen fruits and vegetables. It's important to get a quick freeze when freezing fruit foods at home. A quick freeze means the ice inside the food will form smaller crystals and keep the cell walls intact more. A long, slow freeze results in larger ice crystals that will rupture the cell walls and ultimately affect the texture of your final product. You see a lovely slide here that shows you what's happening during rapid freezing compared to slow freezing. And you can see how the damage is done to those cell walls. It's also important to remember to freeze no more than two to three pounds of food for each cubic foot of freezer space within a 24 hour period. 
if you were to overload your freezer with unfrozen products, um, this is one of those examples of how you would have a long, slow freeze that would ultimately result in a poor quality product. It's important for you to check your freezer size ahead of time and know the proper volume of food that you should be freezing within one day. Proper packaging will help you to avoid freezer burn on your frozen foods. Freezer burn <clears throat> is damage to frozen foods that occurs when they are exposed to dry freezer air. This exposure causes dehydration as well as oxidation, which will affect the color, texture, and flavor of your frozen foods. Technically, the food is still safe to eat, but the quality may take a hit. Use moisture and vapor-proof package materials that are meant for freezer to avoid the unpleasant result of freezer burn. We also want to make sure that you have, um, whoops, just one second. We also wanna make sure that you have, and ah, there we go, sorry about that. I have lost my script. Um, we wanna make sure that people are using the moisture vapor proof. I think I mentioned that. And um, let's see. Ooh, thank you, we're back on. Um, again, just wanna jump ahead and talk about while fall is upon us, there's a still an opportunity for us to maximize those fruits that are still available. Here in Southern Maine, uh, we don't expect our first frost date for several weeks. I know I've got my fingers crossed. It's amazing to see the fruits that are still available at our farmers markets and farm stands. This week alone, I've seen strawberries, blueberries, peaches, raspberries, and some of our seasonal favorites like pears, cranberries, grapes, quince, and apples which can all be frozen and used later in baking, preserves, remember jams and jellies, and also at our holiday meals that are coming up. And while we have your attention, let's discuss home food preserving and frost. The foundation of home food preservation begins with using high quality produce. I just wanna make a, a big point here that fruits and vegetables that have been frost killed are not high quality and should not be used for any type of home food preservation. So now that I've got that in place, I'm going to pass you along to Kate, who is once again in our demonstration kitchen and she's gonna show us how to freeze apples. Kate? Hello. Welcome to the demo kitchen. So first up is freezing fruit. And yes, I'm gonna do apples. Um, we discussed the various uses of, free, of frozen apples while we were preparing for our webinar today. Um, but we came down on that there's lots of great ways you could use apples um, in using in baking in pies. Um, we thought freezing applesauce would be a popular one. But then we decided next month is our preserving apples webinar. So we're going to save all of that good stuff about how to preserve and use apples in depth for next month's webinar, the last one of 2022. Um, so I'm going to be talking about freezing apples in a syrup and using a sugar pack today. But know that this method also could be used to other um, fruits similar to apples like peaches and pears, which Kathy mentioned you can still find here um, in southern Maine in the fall. So to begin, I had um, I bought some nice local Cortland apples um, from a, an orchard here in Maine. And um, I bought just one of those, those bags at the grocery store. And I've washed them, peeled them. And then I have, I'm holding them in this, um, an ascorbic acid dip. Um, but wait, before I get into this, I wanna confirm that we're using the uh, cutting edge technology of the side-by-side -side view where you should be able to see both the front view of me in the kitchen, but the overhead view from my um, phone on a tripod. So if we could have some of our viewers just pop in the Q&A and confirm that you can see both. Um, we'd like to leave it side by side so you can see the action um, versus just the overhead. So let us know that you can see both. And yes, yes, love it. Thank you all so much. Um, 
So we've got the apples cut up and put in this ascorbic acid dip. So this is going to prevent browning. Of course, we're all familiar with an old brown apple that no one wants to eat. Um, so the ascorbic acid dip is just a vitamin C dip. The, I did use the commercial product that's branded as fruit fresh. There's different uh, makers. This one's from Ball, but um, they're all great as far as being ascorbic acid, you can also literally just use vitamin C tablets crushed up. We will include the instructions for making ascorbic acid in our resources today. So I followed the instructions particular to the product I'm using today to prevent my apples from browning. And I'm pleased with how crisp and fresh and white they still look, even though I cut them up maybe half an hour ago by now. So I love that the, the ascorbic acid's doing its job. So when I peeled the apples, I put them in there as I peeled them all. And then I took them out one by one and sliced them and put the slices back in the dip. Um, so this is just for uh, quality and appearance sake. Of course, the uh, safety is coming in from the freezing that we're going to be doing. So to begin, I'm going to show you the syrup um, method of freezing. So I'm going to use a rigid sided container, but you can also freeze in a bag. And I've prepared a heavy syrup, which is what is recommended for tart apples. I tried one of these. They're not super tart, which is great, but they're also not really sweet. So a perfect um, early season apple um, in the Cortland variety. And the instructions for using the, the syrup pack is to prepare the syrup, again, adding a little bit of ascorbic acid to it to prevent browning. And then I pour half a cup per pint into my uh, pint container. So I've got half a cup of syrup in here and I'm gonna ladle out some drained apples. Let me see my pint container on camera. I'm gonna ladle out some drained apples directly into it. So it's very convenient. So I've got a slotted spoon so I can scoop out the apples from the dip and, and fill up the container. We're gonna leave a little bit of space headspace or room for expansion, um, products freeze or expand in the freezer. So there is a fill line on this container, which is nice using a um, freezer grade plastic container. It has a fill line, which I love. Yep. And half a cup wasn't quite enough to uh, cover my fruit in there. The syrup is going to help preserve the texture, flavor, and color of the fruit. So it's is important to have it all covered. So I'm gonna to top it off with a little more and make sure all my slices are under the syrup. And they do start to float up when I add the syrup, which is fine. It just helps me know that I've got plenty in there. And then um, as per the National Center for Home Food Preservation's advice for freezing fruit, I've got a little square of freezer paper that I pre-cut. So freezer paper is a, a product you'll find on the shelves at your stores. It's plastic coated paper um, and it will, it's like what you use if you were to wrap up fish or meat or anything. Um, so it's great for helping prevent those ice crystals that would form otherwise on top. And again, all about quality, protecting the quality of your frozen fruit. So just press that on there gently, making sure everybody's under the water. These, this paper will also help it, um, the slices be held down a little bit. And then with this one, I just snap the lid on. There is a place to write directly on the container. Of course, this container is reusable. Um, so I would find some masking tape or kitchen tape that is that will stick in the freezer, and I would use that to label my containers with sliced apples, September 22. And then again, for best quality, we're looking for our home freezer to be set at zero degrees or below, and then used within eight to 12 months for best quality. So that is syrup pack. I would just repeat that process until all my sliced apples were gone. The other, another method, there's several, but another method you can do is the sugar pack. So we thought this one would be great if you were gonna use these in baking. Um, the recommendation is half a cup of sugar for your one and a quarter pounds of fruit. You could have, it's just for flavor. Um, so you could of course adjust that uh, depending on how much, uh, what am I trying to say? Depending on what you're going to use it in. So you could add the amount of sugar that's like called for in your pie recipe or your crisp recipe, whatever you're doing. So again, same process or I'm um, draining the apples from the ascorbic acid dip and I have my half a cup of sugar pre-measured. Just lost the slices here. Okay. Plenty for what we're doing. I'm just going to show you how to fill up one bag. And I've got my half a cup of sugar for my one and a half pounds of fruit. But toss that together, again, just for flavors. So if you're like, I'm objecting to the amount of sugar, you could use less, the guideline. 
And then we're going to pack this into our bags. So I've got for this one, I'm going to use a zip top freezer grade plastic bag. I'm going to label it first before it's lumpy with apples. I'm going to say apples sugar pack so I know they're sweetened. September 22. Okay. And we'll pack the fruit into the bags. Same thing here where you need to leave room for expansion. I get a ladle out about a spoon over a spatula. This is also where we said I've done um, peaches and syrup in bags before. You can put your Ziploc bag in like a plastic cup. So something to give it structure so that it's easier to um, scoop your slices into, especially if with a liquid where it's going to get real tippy and in danger of spilling. Now with these, you want to, um, instead of filling it up and leaving that amount of headspace, you're going to want to Fill it up, still leaving headspace, but it's important to get the air out of it. So that's the extra step with a bag to attempt to seal it off. And this will prevent ice crystals from forming, again, giving you a higher quality product. This is where people like to use vacuum packaging bags. That's an additional expense, of course, with the appliance and the proprietary bags. Um, but a lot of people swear by the results of the vacuum packaging in the freezer. And then I like to flatten them out so that they, they freeze and can stack easily in the freezer. Um, so we've got our little bit of headspace that I left, nice and labeled. Again, going in the freezer, ideally at zero degrees and use within your eight to 12 months for best quality. Now, both of these methods involve sugar. If you're like, I don't, um, I prefer my fruit frozen without any additional sugar, you would want to use what they call the dry pack, um, which is simply just the fruit prepared as you would want it ready to use. So whether that's um, definitely washed, but whether that's peeled, sliced, pitted, cored, et cetera, um, and then packaged up into the bags directly. So you could pile them in bags like I did. A lot of people also like to tray freeze it where you spread the pieces out. So they freeze individually, freeze them overnight, and then come back and package them keeps the fruit from clumping and can make it easier to use. All right, that is freezing fruit. And we're gonna switch gears um, and go to freezing vegetables. And Kathy's gonna detail that for you. All right, thanks, Kate. Um, so here is a chart of syrup concentrations for freezing fruit. And you can see the range of sugar goes from very light to heavy syrup. Um, and we will send you this chart for your reference with our follow-up email. Um, I want to help people remember that sugar is also providing a protective element um, when we look at it from the science of freezing. And that is the texture of frozen food is suppressed um, the freezing point of water. So sugar protects the texture of frozen fruit food by suppressing the freezing point of water. When that food can, when the food that contains sugar is frozen, the product does not freeze as hard as plain water. The damaging effects of the sharp ice crystals are lessened and texture is preserved. And remember, like Kate said, fruit can be frozen in a dry sugar pack or in a syrup pack. And I know that we did have one question in our Q&A box already, which I'll address with our next bit of information. And that was from Linda asking about the use of sugar substitutes. So sugar substitutes may be used in any of the unsweetened packs, saccharin, aspartame, and sucralose, also known as Splenda, work well in frozen products, or also remember they can be added to the fruit just before serving. Artificial sweeteners give a sweet flavor, but they do not furnish the beneficial effects of sugar, such as color protection, and also making a thicker syrup. So labels on the products give the equivalent to a standard amount of sugar. Use the directions on these containers to determine the amount of sweetener that you want to use. 
We also want to talk about uh, freezer jam. Freezer jam is a great way to freeze fruit. Freezer jams are a simple and very quick alternative to the jams that are processed in a boiling water bath. Remember that this is a great project to do with kids and grandkids. Keep in mind that these types of jams and jellies will have a much softer or looser set than the traditional ones. You can find find low sugar pectins that can be used in the freezer. So when making freezer jams, just like with any jam making, recipes need to be followed exactly. Otherwise you may um, end up with a product that fails to set and is more like a syrup, um, which I might add is great to use on ice cream or pancakes or waffles, uh, but it just won't have that gelling property that you expect in a jam or jelly. Um, you can use plastic freezer grade containers or the half pint or four ounce canning jars with the two part lid when you're making the freezer jams and jellies. When you are ready to use these products, uh, put them in the fridge to safely defrost and also keep them in the refrigerator and use them within two weeks. Um, that's our standard guidance for home preserved foods. And otherwise, if you're keeping them in your freezer, um, jams will keep in the freezer for up to one year for best quality. So now we're going to switch gears and talk about freezing vegetables, the other part of our webinar today. Um, for those looking for a method for preserving vegetables that is less labor intensive than canning, freezing is really a great way to preserve the plentiful haul from your garden. Um, remember that from a preservation standpoint, freezing does retain more of the valuable nutrients like those water soluble vitamins, think vitamin C, um, than canning does. But we often hear from people who are frustrated by the texture of their frozen vegetables, complaining that they may have a rubbery or mushy texture. Today, we've got some tips for creating high quality frozen vegetables that you and your family will actually enjoy. So let's start off by talking about blanching. Most vegetables need to be blanched before they are frozen. This process will create text. Um, if you do not blanch them, you will create texture issues for people. What is blanching? Blanching means to dunk um, your vegetable product briefly in boiling water for a specific amount of time. This process is going to destroy enzymes that can cause unwanted changes in color, texture, and the flavor of your frozen foods. Uh, we're we have a slide here that shows a blanching pot. So this is a very traditional looking blanching pot. It's a three-part unit. It has a cover, it has the pot, and then it has a colander-like insert um, where you would place your vegetables and then the pot is where the boiling water will be. So what this does is to help you be able to blanch just the vegetables and then remove them quickly from the blanching pot using that colander insert. Um, so we do recommend that when you are freezing vegetables, you do have a blanching pot to really help expedite that process of getting the vegetables quickly from a boiling to a cooling state. And cooling your vegetables quickly really, really, really is the key to preserving the texture. The best method for quick cooling your vegetables after the blanching process is to use an ice bath or a bowl full of ice water. The ice bath stops the cooking and makes the vegetables nice and cold before they even go into the freezer, which means they're gonna freeze faster, okay? So remember, we discussed how a quick freeze creates smaller crystals and keeps the cell walls more intact, while that long, slow freeze will result in the large ice crystals that rupture the cell walls, and they create a really flabby final product that can be really mushy. So if you're planning to blanch and freeze a large batch of green vegetables, make sure to have a lot of ice on hand to keep the water nice and cold. 
even if that means buying a few five pound bags of ice from the store, which I, I've had to do um, just to make sure I have plenty of ice on hand. We wanna make sure and let you know that there are several vegetables that do not need to be blanched before freezing. These include tomatoes, peppers, and onions. They can all be frozen raw. We do recommend that you wash and hull the tomato, um, remove that stem end before, before you freeze it to make it ready to eat. You could also cut tomatoes into pieces to freeze them. You could do that in half, you could dice them, or you could cook tomatoes down into a sauce and freeze them in a rigid freezer grade container. You know, really what we hope to impart is that you can make this as simple or as involved as you have the time for. But admittedly, sometimes it is really nice just to be able to throw those whole washed and hulled tomatoes into the freezer and be done with them. And they're ready for you to use later on in the season, in the, in the winter even. Um, slicing and chopping peppers and onions before freezing makes them ready to use. I know I always try to plan ahead with my peppers to think how many do I want to have chopped for things in, you know, stews, chili, um, or how many do I want to actually slice and have ready for a stir fry. So I mix mine up a little bit, um, chopping them to be in accordance with how I'm going to use them in my meal later on. So we've uh, given Kate a quick turnaround and hopefully she's ready in the kitchen to start talking to us about how to freeze kale. Kate, take it away. Kate, you're muted. <laughs> Amateur hour, this is like year three of webinars. You think I'd know better by now. Thank you. I've got my kale all ready to go, all washed and chopped into the bite-sized pieces. And kale needs to be blanched for three minutes. Um, so I've got my blanching basket behind me with boiling water in it. The recommendation is to not use more than one pound of vegetables per gallon of water when you're blanching them. It's really important the water comes back to a boil quickly because your blanching time is just the boiling time. So you have to wait for it to return to a boil. So if you overload it with a bunch of veggies, it'll take longer and it will just be like cooking your vegetables unnecessarily, which is what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to hit the sweet spot where you blanch the vegetables to destroy enzymes, but don't overcook them because you have to cook them to serve them. As soon as I took the lid off, it stopped boiling. So I cranked the heat up so that I've got my washed chopped kale going into boiling water. I honestly don't know if this is a pound of kale, nor really what a pound of kale would look like. <laughs> Maybe a lot. And it's gonna start to uh, collapse as I put it in the, the blanching basket. Obviously kale takes up a lot of space when it's raw. And then as it cooks, it reduces in its size, which makes it the perfect candidate for freezing. So you can freeze a lot of it in a small amount. That looks good in the name of not overwhelming my water. It's already turning this beautiful green color. So I'm gonna put the lid on because remember, it's two minutes of blanching when the water is boiling and wait for the water to return to a boil. Which I hope it does sooner rather than later. <laughs> it's always the part where I'm like, hurry, you're cooking. <laughs> All right, um, but in the meantime, I did pull some things out of our freezer here in the kitchen to show you because I knew we'd have some ambient waiting time while we wait for our water to return to a boil and to blanch. Um, so we've got, Fiddleheads that we did in the spring. And just wanna show you, they've got some ice crystals formed in there, which again, um, is not an indication of freezer burn that these are gonna necessarily be bad, but just maybe some moisture that has come out of the veggies or was they weren't as dry as maybe we'd like them. Although we're pretty good about putting only dry veggies in for freezing. Um, and they're kind of frozen solid into a clump. So that's to be expected. However, this is like a perfect portion for dinner of fiddleheads. So you would just aim to use this whole thing. When I first started freezing, I was like, I'm gonna just use a giant bag and I filled it full of corn kernels. And then I was like struggling to um, portion them off when it came to use it. So it's just frozen solid in a giant cube. Okay, so this has come back to a boil. So I'm gonna start my two minute timer. Timer, something on here. 
um, so I filled this gallon sized bag full of corn and then I was in the difficult scenario of like smashing it on the counter to try and break piece off or cut it with a knife, which is dangerous and bad for your knives. Um, so we really recommend you think ahead, like how am I gonna use this? Just freeze it in your family's portion size. So if you're an individual, freeze smaller portions that you would eat in a meal, create some leftovers, or just aim to use the whole thing up in, um, in the dish you're gonna prepare it. So that's fiddlehead. These definitely should be moved along as far as quality goes. Um, and then here's another bag, which I love the idea of. It's chopped onion and celery. I honestly don't remember why I had extra chopped onion and celery, but I thought um, I really love like mixing together things that then can be used as a meal starter. So you could even add peppers to this and then you would have a great beginning for a stew or do carrots. Um, I think they might tell you not to free that celery doesn't freeze well because of its high water content. But if you're just using it in a super stew, um, I, I don't have a problem with the quality. It's going to be cooked. This is not something you're going to try and like thaw and spread peanut butter on and serve as a snack. The, the celery, not the onions. <laughs> so it's as far as texture goes, it's going to get cooked anyway. And then we have some leftover spaghetti sauce, which we were canning, I believe. And we froze the part, portion that didn't fill the last jar. Um, so this not a whole lot, but it's enough for a meal, of course. So I love that. Nice and flat, so it doesn't take up much room. And then this was some chipotle that we used in a salsa recipe, I believe. Ooh, it's cold. Um, so this, these are canned adobe peppers and adobe. And um, it's a commercial product, but this is just a fun little tip where then it's, if you have leftover can, like I often do this with tomato paste too, um, tomato paste or chipotle peppers, um, put them in a bag, flatten it out. And then when it comes time to use it, you just break off a piece because it's thin. And then you could just take out that broken off piece and use it in your recipe. All right, blanching kale is complete. So here you can see the blanching basket in action. It does have a safety concern where if you pull it out too quickly, the water will come shooting out. So definitely um, avoid that. I'm gonna get a bowl to put it in. And pull it up nice and slow, avoiding the hot geyser of water that can come out of the side. And then I have my ice bath set up and I put in it the um, insert from the salad spinner and it's sunk down in there. So I've got a lot, of, a lot of ice in the water and then I put the colander or salad spinner insert into it. So what this does is keeps the kale separate from the ice chips. So if you just dump your vegetables into your ice bath in with the ice, um, you have to come back and pick the vegetables out from amongst the ice. Whereas now I'm in a position to just pull the colander out and have it drain versus having to pick each little piece of broccoli out from around the ice. Pro tip is what we call that. So I'm also agitating it to the help if there's like water that's warming up, um, have it be replaced by colder water from the outside. So of course I'm using kale. We had a little brainstorm session before our webinar and we came up with lots of other great fall um, greens that you could use this method for. I don't know about you, but greens are like, of course they go off bad really quickly and a little goes a long way. So I'm constantly looking for ways to use them up um, and freezing for later use is a great way to keep being from being overwhelmed by them. Um, so we said you could also apply this method for chard, Swiss chard, spinach, collard greens, mustard greens. Kathy decided beet tops, which I love the idea of beets or turnip greens, um, all of those are gonna be exactly the same method with the caveat that collards gets one more minute of blanching, but everything else is two minutes. Collards is three minutes. Okay, ooh, yeah, I was like, I'm gonna do a field test. They're nice, Get the greens are nice and cold. They no longer feel like they are, that they've been in boiling water, which is our goal. I wanna get them as cool as we can so they freeze as quickly as possible. We have tons of questions, I think. So I'm gonna look through. 
Uh, well, I'd like to chime in right now and just point out how wonderfully green that yes. kale has stayed. Um, and we all know that where there's that lovely bright green color, we, we know that that's where there's a lot of nutrient retention. So great job there highlighting that, Kate. Oh, I, I did want to show, or I don't know if I'll show it, but point out that the, the water, the blanching water is green. So that does represent a little bit of nutrient loss, but um, not to counteract what you're saying, just made me think of how green that water is as well. Okay. So I got my greens. You can see how much they've compressed after being boiled compared to the fresh. And I'm gonna use the salad spinner. If you don't have a salad spinner, we have a lot of, not a lot of gadgets. We have all the gadgets we need, but <laughs> if you're not a gadget person, um, you can also just use your clean kitchen towels. Emphasis on the word clean. I have cats and I tried this once and I feel like I introduced cat hair into the process, which was really upsetting. So I definitely prefer a salad spinner, but clean kitchen towels to dry off your vegetables, paper towels if you are looking to avoid the cloth towels. So spin, 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 and we'll check on them. You're not gonna get them bone dry, but you want any excess water removed. Such a nice salad spinner. Salad spinners are kind of like you get what you pay for. This is a nice one. <laughs> All right, and then I've got my zip top bag already labeled kale September 2022. And I'm just gonna pack it using my hands. Fill up the bag, press it in there. I could fit so much in there, I love it. I feel like with kale, like if I'm adding kale to a soup or something, there's not really an amount that I would be upset to have in there. So for my, for me and my family, a whole quart size bag of kale would be like a great size portion. So I've left a little bit of headspace. I'm gonna seal it partially. I'll do the old squish it up against myself to remove the air as I seal it the rest of the way. All right, ooh, it's so compressed, I love it. Nice and flat. <laughs> all the air out of there, all the moisture out of there, room for expansion, good to go. Pop it in the freezer with all the other goodies I pulled out from earlier. And again, back to recommending you use it within eight to 12 months for best quality. All right, how'd I do? Did I get to everything? I think so. Let's <laughs> check in with Lori for your questions. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. <laughs> I'm like everyone else. <laughs> um, I do want to just pop a question in that I had just answered in that um, that this is recorded and it will be be available, I think, within a week. Um, usually they're available a week-ish. Um, Kate, is that about the amount of time it usually takes, about a week for them to become available? It's usually, it's usually up by tomorrow, but yeah. Oh, I mean, even it's better. Beginning was... of the week. Okay, great. Um, but we do have a question going back to adding spices before freezing. Um, we had talked about the sugar and and like that. But at the same time, this one came up on adding spices from Donna. Kathy had flagged when we were discussing the pie. She said, I might hold off if you're creating uh, fruit in the means of using it in baking. She might hold off on adding the spices because they could lose their flavor in the freezer over time. So you might want to depends on how much you really want that ready to eat product. You might want to consider mixing in the spices before you do the baking. Okay, great. Um, Donna was also wondering when we were talking about um, the vegetable freezing part, um, how about basil and other herbs? We love talking about freezing herbs, yes. <laughs> um, so Freezing is a great way to preserve your herbs and they don't need to be blanched before they're frozen. Um, you will see recommendations like specifically around basil because it will help protect the color of the product. Um, so a lot of herbs you can just chop and put in the freezer. However, they might like um, become unappealing looking. They might turn an unpleasant color, blackish, brownish, dark green. Um, so we recommend, I've, I have found greater success with kind of um, blending them with something, whether that's um, herbs blended in water, oils of any kind, uh, melted butter, um, stock, whether that's vegetable, chicken stock, 
um, and then stuff that a product that you, when you add it to whatever you're cooking, you don't mind that it's in there. So you could do cubes of herbs in stock and then the stock would go into your soup and it would be fine that it was in frozen in stock. That's so perfect for a rainy day <laughs> when I'm thinking about that. Uh, we do have another question from Karen um, asking about a good resource for finding out how long to blanch each vegetable. Mm. We will include that. We have these um, quick guides for freezing and it has every vegetable that we grow in the Northeast and it's a um, blanching time. And then the ice bath time is the same as the blanching time. Okay. Uh, that is all we have for questions right at the moment. And I'm just going to head to the slide on our recommended resources. All right. And just to let you know, we do have time for another question or two. So if you have thought of one, please go ahead and type it in that Q&A box and we'll get to it. Um, but meanwhile, I'll let you know about what you will be receiving with that very quick turnaround that we have um, for the resources from this um, webinar. So we're going to send you Let's Preserve Apples, Let's Preserve Jams, Jellies and Spreads, um, syrups for freezing fruits, and then those freezing quick guides, which I think are super handy uh, because they are just a page, two-sided page. Um, they give you by fruit type some specific information, and in particular that blanching time that is required for vegetables. So super handy to, to keep um, easy access to in your kitchen with your other um, cookbooks and recipe guides. We also will have information on freezing raw tomatoes with and without their skins. And then also a lovely, and I might add incredibly popular, one of our YouTube DIY videos on how to freeze tomatoes. Um, so this does get into that very simple technique of freezing tomatoes. And a freezer inventory template, which is something very important to keep um, on hand to save yourself the time that you may spend digging through your, if you have a chest freezer, um, to find out what's on the bottom of that. So a freezer inventory uh, will be sent your way as a template to use to know what is in your freezer, what you've used, and what remains there for you to find. So I do see we've got one more question, two more questions in the box. So let's go to those before I wrap up. Okay. And um, the first, uh, Laurie, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was just going to mute myself, but I'll, I'll jump in. So Anne would like to know, can you, can you use, say, green peppers to put in a salad after freezing, or should you stick with cooking the green peppers? So free, uh, once they're frozen, they are not going to be at that quality that you would expect for a fresh cut fruit or vegetable to go in a salad. Um, for a fruit salad, if you can catch it when it still has some ice crystals remaining, that will be a nice solid um, piece of food to have in a salad. But I would not recommend using a frozen tomato pepper or anything like that in a salad. It will be good for cooking texture wise. Thank you. So um, when it comes to fine fruits, uh, when they're frozen in plastic food grade containers, what's the best method for thawing? So with all thawing, we recommend that that happens in the refrigerator, which is a controlled environment. You're going to be at 40 degrees or lower. So that's going to help you have a slow thaw. Um, and you're also going to want to put that container in a bowl or on a tray or something to catch those, um, the water that runs off from the frozen product. So that is the best technique in your freezer on a tray, uh, excuse me, in your refrigerator on a tray, um, and then you'll be ready to use it. So it can take up to 24 hours, depending on the volume of what you've got, you have for something to um, defrost to be able to use. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so we will be back next month, October 20th, to demonstrate different ways to preserve apples. I've got my apple here. I'm ready to eat for my uh, lunch. And we'll be sure to share the resources and recipes from today's topic 
as well as the registration for our next webinar via email. So look for that in your inbox later today. And we will also be sharing a link to an evaluation as well as that certificate of completion. And please complete our evaluation and provide us with your um, US mailing address and we'll send you a free Headspace tool, which is a great gadget to have on hand when canning. So, oh, I do see we have one more question in the Q&A box. Let's see, is it a quick one? It is a thank you from Donna. <laughs> All right, you're very welcome, Donna. So thanks to everyone for joining us today. We had a good crowd here today. We hope to see all of you on October 20th for our next webinar. Bye everyone, thank you.